Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, this is uh, the second uh, part of uh, what we discussed recently, uh, my journey to become a doctor in Australia. So let's get on to the second part of my journey. Uh, you remember from the last time I was talking about uh, how I did the AMC part one and part two, and then what sort of uh, things I had to do before and get to get through the part two exam. Now, from today, I'm going to discuss from part two, so, so the su successful completion of AMC part two, to getting a job in a hospital in Australia. Okay, let's get on to the story. Okay, it's a nice story. So, remember, I did the AMC part two in... Uh, Sydney Children's Hospital and then I got through successfully and then I gave you some examples of the cases I had to do and things. So I got through the part two and then I thought, oh yeah, okay, I'm now uh, eligible to get the job at a, a hospital in Australia. Uh, then I had, um, I prepared my CV again with the part two exam results, English and AMC part one and all of my other qualifications. And then I wrote a um, cover letter. Uh, for the guys who haven't seen it, I have told them how to write your cover letter and then how to write, a, how to prepare your CV according to the upper format. This is, uh, that's there in my other channel. So then I, uh, okay, I prepared for application of jobs, which is um, the next part of your journey. Once you clear AMC exams, the next part is to find a job. So today, what I'm going to discuss is how to find a job and how I found my job, which is interesting journey because it, you had to do, uh, I had to do a lot of things to come to that level. <laughs> Uh, so got the exam results, did my, arrange my CV and prepare my cover letter and then I applied. I applied in different ways because I live in, still I am living in a, a country town in Bendigo, not far from Melbourne. So um, I just targeted the Bendigo base hospital first thing which has some connections already as you can remember. I used to go to case discussion in that hospital case discussion group in that hospital. So I targeted the Bendigo based hospital as well as other hospitals close by, hospitals in Melbourne and then um, South Australia, Western Australia, um, New South Wales, everywhere actually, even in Tasmania. So what I did was like uh, applying directly to the hospitals applying um, through the um, RMO campaign, mainly the PMCV match in uh, Victoria, uh, which is the RMO campaign for Victoria. I have done another video about this, how to go through this uh, campaign. And then I applied uh, uh, directly to other hospitals. Uh, from my memory, I have applied for Shepparton Hospital, uh, Swan Hill Hospital, Echuca Hospital, uh, Frankston Hospital, Western Group of Hospitals, Monash Health, um, almost all of Ballarat Hospital, uh, almost all the hospitals in Victoria, uh, plus um, the um, RMO campaign, mainly the Victorian RMO campaign because I was targeting the clo places close to my home too. So, so I kept active on all those areas, direct application plus uh, direct applications to hospital through the HMO units. And then I applied through the RMO campaign too. And then I was waiting, um, didn't get some hospitals answered, some, uh, not many hospitals give me any interview even. Um, I didn't get any interview from any hospital like, Frankston or Western or any other hospitals. And um, even Bendigo, I didn't get any interview at the first place. Um, 
then uh, RMO campaign, I was waiting on the same thing as well. So I got different numbers for different applications and things. And uh, I was, although I was uh, trying that way, I was also active with the other group of um, people, other group of uh, international medical graduates who actually studied with us uh, in um, Monash uh, under Dr. Johannes Wenzel's class. So we were sort of talking to each other and then would um, discuss other options. How do you go about finding a job and things? Um, somehow a lot of people said to me, okay, you better do uh, observership if it's possible. Uh, if you do observership while working as a lecturer in um, the same area in Bendigo, uh, the best option was, would be to try observership in the local hospital, Bendigo Hospital, which I knew a little bit, like because I used to go to the hospital. Um, so then I asked for observership, writing to the HMO unit, maybe writing to uh, ED director as well, from my memory. But it was not forthcoming, so no one offered a observership. A uh, bit frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> you have completed your exams, you got your English qualifications, you have done your bridging course, um, you are almost there with uh, the qualifications they request and um, request from you, but still the job is not coming. Um, then I was. Um, talking to different people, including my brother who's in Melbourne, and he's again a doctor in Australia. So I said to him, okay, I got through the exams, but still <laughs> this is not possible. I may need a observership. Um, finally, um, so he gave me a link. That link is not directly to the ED director of Bendigo Hospital, but one of the rehab physicians uh, working in, um, then working in Bendigo Hospital. And uh, the rehab physician then spoke to me while I was in the uni. And then he asked, Kirti, what do you want to do? What's your plans? And um, then I remember I said, uh, because I, I'm in the uni, I like to get my full registration with uh, the uh, with APRA for the clinical registration. And I'm thinking about doing research as well because my brother told me like that, okay, talk about research with this guy. And um, then he said, oh yeah, uh, for research, it would be better your brother if he collaborate because you are a bit of a junior guy still in the system. Anyway, uh, what do you require? I said, at least, uh, um, observership to start with. Then he uh, actually uh, negotiated with the then ED director, a lady, and uh, I got the observership offer. This was in 2013, um, immediately, not immediately, after uh, it's like a six months or so after my part two results, AMC part two results. So I did the observership. Uh, initially, they offered it for a uh, one month. They said, okay, this is a one month observership. There was a, a guide to say, like, uh, there was a kind of a handbook for the observer to fill, like, this many cannulation. I have observed this and I have done this and that sort of thing to sort of tick and um, fill, like, there was a book. Uh, it was not a necessity that time, but it has been there for a while at the emergency department, Bendigo. So I got a copy and then I decided, okay, I'll work according to this booklet so that I will cover what they suppose us to cover as observers. So I went in there and then um, uh, I was introduced to the uh, ED doctors. Um, uh, director herself and then the other doctors on the floor. Um, uh, I got to know two of the um, senior ED doctors. They were uh, like deputy directors, I think one clinical, one academic or something. Uh, those two guys I get 
to know. <laughs> I don't like to mention their name. One of them is still my friend, uh, LinkedIn um, contact, and we time to time message to each other and things like that. Uh, something else I have to mention here, those two guys actually are like similar age like myself and around same age, but they are like uh, fellowship holders for emergency medicine and then quite senior guys, one of them now in a now a director in like um, the one I have close links with is now the director in a leading hospital in Melbourne, emergency department. And uh, so I got to know those two guys and then um, they were sort of observing what I'm doing. And then the, the guy I was uh, having close links with uh, was the guy actually leading me to do a few different things. He would say, oh, okay, there's a cannula, like a catheterization happening. Do you want to do the catheter yourself or you want to observe? And, and then I remember I said to him, okay, maybe this is the first time because I will observe this time. Next time I'll do it myself. And um, so then I was um, observing a, a local graduates, like an intern, uh, doing the catheterization of a um, emergency patient. It was interesting because that's why we have to do the observation because um, with the facilities you have back home and then the way you do things and the facilities you have here and uh, you know the sterility, uh, the way they do the procedure and um, things like that. Uh, it was perfectly done by the intern. He's a good friend of mine now. He's a GP around here somewhere. And um, uh, it was perfectly done. He was he was a graduate from um, Deakin University uh, in Victoria, uh, medical graduate. And so he did the catheterization. So I just observed and then I make a note to say, okay, I observed. Um, the process of catheterization and the cannulation, of course, I got like I think you guys understand from my sort of um, uh, way of doing things and what I am talking about and things like that. I'm a very friendly character, so I'll get friendly with a lot of people quickly, like a uh, networking. And so I got friendly with all the other HMOs, like international graduates in the emergency department. So I would follow one or two. Uh, I remember there was a lady at Jimmo. I was uh, saying to her, okay, I will just uh, observe you today. Um, then I will following her and then she would ask, oh, if you want to do this cannulation, there's a cannulation to be done. So then I did, um, for my observership period, I probably did um, more than five cannulation, five to 10 maybe. Um, according to the person whoever I'm following. Uh, so I did few of them. So I just got used to cannulation at the emergency department while I was observing. Um, the other doctor would introduce me to the patient to say, okay, this is another doctor uh, training in the emergency department at the moment. Is that okay if you do the cannulation under my supervision? So that sort of thing. So I did few of those uh, smaller procedures, right? And then observing a plaster being done. And uh, so I ticked all this to say, okay, I have observed this, observed that. And then um, one day the director lady said to me, okay, I will, okay, Kirti, you are seeing this patient under me. And so she said, okay, go and see that patient and make a plan. And then, so I did history examination. I think it was hyperemesis gravidarum, like a vomiting during the pregnancy, early pregnancy. Uh, so that case, I said, okay, these are the findings. This would be the blood test I'd be doing. And then IV fluid and um, uh, checking liver functions and things like that. And so, uh, so she said, like we had then had a discussion about presentation to her, presented the case to her and uh, discussed the management plans and things like that. After a few days, she said, uh, so you were booked to do the observership for one month. I don't think you had to do one month now, maybe do two weeks and then that's it. Uh, 
So I stopped at two weeks of observership. And okay, back to uh, the lecturing work again, and then kept applying for hospital jobs again. I was mainly concentrating on Bendigo base that time because I have uh, done an observership there as well. So um, the CV of mine got that bit too. Okay, observership at Bendigo Hill from this date to this date. And then, um, so that's the CV updated. I don't know whether I um, mentioned to you guys with the other video, I also did a bit of an observership with a local GP uh, in a local GP clinic, not far from here, uh, about two kilometers from here, next to the university, close to the university too. So just walking distance to university and a um, bit of a far away, but still walking distance to my home. So I did uh, time to time go and observe uh, that senior GP. He's now retired. He's in Melbourne. Um, and so he's an Indian general practitioner, so who offered me to uh, uh, have observation with him too. So I put that to my CV. So I observed Dr. So-and-so uh, at his clinic, and then I observed the, uh, I did the observation at the uh, emergency department for two weeks. With that, you know, like the HMO, um, application uh, comes twice a year, one in, in February and then the other one in July. So I kept applying for the HMO jobs in Bendigo, Bendigo Health, plus other places as well. Um, so after, I, so there's one more thing about the observership in Bendigo Health. While I was doing the observership, I realized there was a, a weekly teaching session for the registrars. That's a registrar teaching session. It's called the M, &M meeting or morbidity and mortality meeting. But the, one of the registrars would be taking the presentation and then one of the uh, fellowship holder emergency physicians will be there as a guide. And then all the other junior doctors, including HMOs, registrars, medical students, um, interns, everyone would attend the session. And then uh, generally one of the senior clinicians, say a surgeon or a uh, ICU consultant or pediatrician or someone would present for one hour or so. But the, this teaching session run from generally from eight o'clock up to 12, 11, 12. The doctors, um, keep coming and going depending on who need to be at the floor, in the floor. Some need to be working at the emergency department. The others would come uh, to the class. The guys who are not rostered or some of the rostered guys would also come. So for those two weeks, I attended that class. And then I told my like a closer um, consultant, I would like to attend this class even though I'm not observing if you don't mind then he said okay you can come to that class but no one else um, that means he said okay you come in but don't bring anyone else like you know the other other international graduates who are living in Pendigo don't bring them but you can come in he, they probably knew that there's others who are knocking at the door and others who are practicing um, trying to get jobs. There were a few. At, at least um, I knew four of them, uh, two Sri Lankans and two other countries. So there were a few around in Bendigo uh, looking for jobs and looking for observerships and things like that. Anyway, I got the offer. Like he said, okay, join our class if you wish, which is every uh, Wednesday from 8 to 12. So I attended the two sessions while I was an uh, observer at the emergency department. After that, I got the permission from one of the, like the education director of the emergency department to say, okay, Kirti can come as a voluntary uh, guy. He can come every week. So from that time, like I think it's early, uh, sometimes early, like um, say April, May, somewhere, 
um, from 2013, every week I attended that class. Every week from Wednesday, eight o'clock to 12 o'clock, I went in there voluntarily. And uh, I should give, give uh, my credit to the supervisor or the professor who was uh, heading our department in La Crobe Uni because he said, ah, oh, yeah, you can take that time off, do your studies, do your teaching in the afternoon, and then use that time. So that was uh, very kind of him for me to allow to do that. So I just got time off to do that class. So every week I was attending the emergency department teaching which is like, I was not an emergency doctor there, but I only did observership for two weeks. And then I was attending every week. You remember the guy I was uh, doing the um, catheter observation with? Uh, so the intern, he was also attending whenever possible. So I got a lot of friends after that. I made a lot of friends who are doctors working in Bendigo Health because every week you will be there and then you'll find doctors there. Um, some would be presenting like a pediatric surgeon would be presenting or the ICU consultant would be presenting. Uh, and then you guys know that I, I got an anatomy background. So when the discussion happening there in the uh, teaching session, they put up a, a CT for instance, CT of a brain. And then they would say, what's this uh, mark? And what do you think about it? what are the differential diagnoses? Then I would sort of score some marks in front of the others because I could interpret a CT, you know, like I would say, ah, oh, this is subdural, this is epidural, a midline shift. There are some fluid, um, you know, like those terms. Uh, there are some fluid um, at the subarachnoid space. Can you see that? And can you see that? And so kind of active discussion. Although, <laughs> although I was not, working there it's it's interesting because um some of the registrars would come to me uh, sitting next to me would say hey Keith, what are you doing uh, you know like i get paid to attend to this because he is uh, paid he get those four hours paid for him like an hourly trade but for myself it's free because i'm not getting paid but i'm learning or i'm networking i'm joining with them uh, so I would score some marks. For instance, uh, when the when the PED surgeon uh, came and presented about um, uh, portion of testis was the topic, and then I had a experience about hearing something happened in Sri Lanka uh, to someone close to us, uh, suspecting torsion of testis, and then going to the surgeon, going to the physician and reading about the clinical features and red flags and everything, and then age records and things like that. So I just started discussion. When she asked questions, I answered. Um, so more than the normal registrars, I got the answers right. So that so got a bit of attention there as well. I think you guys following what I'm trying to say to you, you, you should be kind of active and you should be showing some interest and you should be like um, showing the people that you are tapping at that door. Um, so that was a very interesting time. I was attending this class every week. Every week you would be um, like uh, involving with all those discussions, good discussions, learning points, uh, near misses, um, and everything happened in the emergency department. It was a very good uh, resource for me to sort of brush up my clinical knowledge as well. At the same time, those guys, the, those consultants who were running the class probably got to know the guy who's coming as an observer and then now doing these classes, uh, attending these classes every day, not missing anything every week. So every week I'll be attending every Wednesday. So I did, did, did this for almost an year and then kept applying. And then I got the return from the um, uh, HMO unit to say, okay, Kirti, you are not successful this time, not successful this time. It happened a few times. 
Um, whenever a HMO job available in Bendigo Health, I'll apply and then I'll get the same response. So I applied for the one in 2014, um, February one. And then I got an interview for the first time. So I attended the interview um, at the Bendigo Health um, interview room. And then the consultant, there was a consultant, I think gynecologist a lady. And then uh, who was interviewing me said, Ah, Kirti, you got all this background with you, but um, you haven't touched a patient. It would be hard for you to come into the clinical setting straight away. Um, and then I said, what should I do? I have done these exams and I have done all these. And then that's the time I think she probably told me, okay, you better do an observership too. I don't know how you get, go about, but try something. And then um, I was rejected at that time. I think it, sorry, it was not 2014. That was 2013, July one, like the intake. Uh, so I was not successful. And then um, from the 2014 one, I applied. I didn't get an interview, but I got a rejection notice to say, okay, you are not successful this time. Uh, I then, then, I think this is what uh, is interesting and this, these are the things that would motivate you guys. When I got the interview, uh, so when I got the email, I just replied to the email saying, saying okay, uh, I understand that um, I have not fulfilled the criteria for your position but I would like to get some more clarification why I was uh, not suitable for this position. Please clarify. <laughs> and then I said, okay, I have completed this, this, these things. I have done part one, part two, bridging course, um, observership, and then attending these classes for almost an year. And um, tell me why I'm not suitable. That's when to the HMO unit, replied to the HMO unit email. And um, I was waiting in the uh, lecturer's office in La Trobe Uni and then uh, wondering like, okay, I was rejected this time too. Now, nothing more I can do. I have done all those things. Now it's doing some rotation in a hospital. Um, then I took the phone and then rang the um, director at the Bendigo Health, just dialed his number and rang. And then the other, from the other end, the director picked the phone and say, okay, I, I told, oh, I'm Kirti from La Trobe Uni. And I wanted, I applied for my uh, HMO job recently and I got rejected. Then he said, oh, Kirti, I, I was about to reply to your email I got your email about uh, needing clarifications. I'm about to reply to your email, he said. Then I said, oh, no, don't worry. I'm not far from your place. It's only five minutes from here. I will drive in and then we'll talk. <laughs> okay. So I will, uh, I told the director like that. Uh, he was, uh, he was appointed the director of hospital just um, recent to that time, like a few months earlier. I'm not sure whether he's around still. I think he would be doing another role now. Uh, and then I met him personally. I just said, oh, five minutes drive. I'm, I'm free now. I can drive in. So I just took the car from the university and then drove to the Bendigo Health, which is only five minutes drive. Uh, and then I met the guy, met the director at his room, took, my, took a copy of my CV and went to meet him. And then he said, oh, yeah, come in, Kirti. I saw your email and then nice to see you and come and sit. And then I said to him, um, I don't understand why it was rejected. Um, see my CV here. Tell me if there's anything need to be done to this CV or is there anything needed to upgrade? Because it, it got all the information I about me. Um, I'm not understanding why this uh, my uh, application get rejected 
and then he said first at, at the first instance, instance he was not interested much oh, yeah there's a HMO job it was rejected so what's the what's the big deal and then I said okay I told him I don't like to mention their names but I told him okay Dr. So and so uh, please have a look at my CV and tell me any improvement needed or anything so I just forced him to have a look at my CV but at the same time I kept talking and then I said you know Dr. So and so I have seen your uh, LinkedIn profile and then then I said to him okay looking at your LinkedIn profile it's very very similar to mine I said to him okay we have we have had a similar journey because he's a he's a doctor from another country I think he's from New Zealand and then moved here and then he had a bit of a research background and then he's uh, had clinical background now he's the director at the hospital Bendigo Health so I think that interested him a bit more so he went into my CV and just had a look and said, oh, it's interesting. Uh, you have done many things, man. So something like that. And then he said, uh, what are you expecting from us? I said, I need to get the full registration. To get the full registration, I at least need 12 months of rotations. In theory, one year of clinical rotations, like emergency, he, he know all this. So I said, I need at least one year of clinical rotation. He said, uh, okay, we'll think about it. Um, I'll try to try to help you to do those uh, um, one years of rotations. And then so I said, okay. Um, uh, while, sorry, <laughs> I keep coming back and forth. Because when I tried to sell myself to this guy, I just told some other things. I said, do you know, I used to come to this uh, once a week uh, clinical sessions at the uh, the emergency department and then the classes at the same level of uh, your office at level five. Uh, that class is uh, run by the GP for IMGs and then which I mentioned last video in last video and then I mentioned about um, this emergency department classes every Wednesday I'll come to these classes and then um, I told him okay uh, I used to come to those two things and then the people around here will um, just greet me here and there at the lift or at the stairs the staircases and then say they would ask it's it's, it's usual question actually they would ask Kirti have you got a job this time man <laughs> so they will ask like you know are the HMOs are the intern and or even registrars or consultants they would ask have you got a job this time so I just mentioned to him you know like I am here, I have been here for now almost two years or something, uh, two, three years. I was keep I was keep attending classes, keep coming for like a different places in the hospital, but I am still not working here. It's bizarre, isn't it? You will be in the hospital most of the time, yeah, but you're not working. And then when you go out to the staircase or when you go on a lift or something, they would ask, Kirti, have you started working here? <laughs> so I told him, okay, that's the typical question I get when I go out from your room, which is true. And then, uh, in fact, when I, I will tell you a bit later, uh, then he said, okay, we will organize something. Um, make sure like um, I will I will make sure that it will happen so I was happy and then I came back uh, then the day after I went to the uh, usual emergency department classes you remember the director I was talking about the education director that guy then asked uh, I was sitting at the class uh, then he said, "Ah, oh, good morning, Kirti. How are you? Have you got a job this time? He asked, have you got a job this time? I said, no. I was with the director yesterday, like a clarifying, I wanting the clarification to say why it was rejected this time too. He said, oh, no, 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 I will, I will talk to the HMO unit. So there was a push from the director and then there was some sort of backing from the emergency department education director. Um, both of them I had 
uh, good discussions time to time. And uh, uh, the director, hospital director only once, but the other guy I would meet uh, every week. So the next day, I got an email to say, okay, Dr. Kulasekara, uh, you got an interview with um, the hospital director and the HMO unit manager on, on this day, uh, around this time, and uh, please attend the uh, interview. Okay, so the, so I met the hospital director requesting the clarification for the rejection of the application. And then I went to the usual class and met the ED director. Uh, and then a few days later, I got the interview. And then at the interview, there was the hospital director on site and then the HMO unit manager. Hospital director said, oh, I, I have spoken to you two days ago. I don't have any more questions. I got all the clarifications. Have you got anything? He asked from the um, HMO unit manager. She said, uh, she asked some, you know, like uh, questions about um, uh, non-medical things, uh, administrative and otherwise. And uh, that's it. And then they said, okay, come and do a rotations and emergency department. Okay, that's the second part of my journey. So I, this is when I started the emergency department HMO. I just started as a HMO in emergency department. I think they put me uh, with a registrar for seven nights or something at the beginning. They didn't do any other observership or anything with me because I already did the observership and already in their classes. And then they just offered the HMO job and then I just joined the ED. Just before I finish, that's the completion of the second part of this uh, talk. Um, just before I finish, remember I told you that I told the director if I go out, someone would ask whether I would be working. So I came out from his room and then came to the lift at the level five of the building. Then at the lift was that uh, guy, you remember the one who, uh, uh, who was doing the catheterization, the intern, who was doing the catheterization with me. Um, when I was an observer, he asked Kirti, have you got a job this time? <laughs> so that's the typical question I got. And then the day after, I actually got the job. Okay, that's the second part of my story. Hope you guys enjoy it.